Today is June 24th, 2013. We're here at the campus of Ball State University to interview our World War II veteran, Frank Chambers. Uh, Frank, can you tell us when and where you were born? I was born in Tipton, Indiana on June the 4th, 1923. As you grew up, uh, did you anticipate any of the events that would unfold during the 1940s? No, no. not at all. So shortly after your 18th birthday, uh, what was your reaction to getting your letter from Uncle Sam? Well, I, uh, I'd saved money for college, so I took the money out of the bank and bought a car. <laughs> but I, uh, yeah, I was expecting it, so. Uh, and I got, the, I got the notice in June of 42, and they took me in in January of 43. And were you, uh, I guess, anticipating going into the Army, or was that decided for you? Well, yeah, it was. They asked me down at Fort Benjamin Harrison if I'd like to go into the Air Force, and I said, oh, I certainly would. And so I ended up, uh, I had, didn't even know they had tanks, hadn't seen one, but that's where I ended up. So. And you went through training. Where was your advanced training? Uh, training was all in Fort Lewis, Washington. And they had a tank training center there, did they? Yeah, have? well, yeah, pretty much. And then we went two months in the Oregon desert on maneuvers and six weeks in a firing range in Yakima, Washington, all included in that. Well, actually, it was 13 months. And then we went east and kept going east. <laughs> How would you describe your training here in the States? Was it Very good. It was actually, we were actually, I thought, better trained than most outfits over there. And uh, the, we, uh, we got good stuff. I mean, it was, you know, good training. We were well equipped to do what we did. And, and uh, the thing that really helped is, of course, the separate tank battalion is assigned a to an a infantry division. And uh, most of the infantry divisions had no ideas what tanks could do or what could. But when we were in England for six weeks, our uh, uh, recon officer, a uh, battalion recon officer, went over to, it, to Ireland where the 5th the, uh, Infantry Division was training. And he went through all the battalions and said, this is what tanks can do and this is what tanks cannot do. And so we were probably one of the best combinations that went, went across Europe because of that. You had a good working relationship then with the infantrymen. Yes, the, yes, and they knew what to ask for and what not to ask for, you know. So. Were you nervous when you started heading east and it looked like you were going to Europe because the Germans had invented the Blitzkrieg and were very well known oh, for Oh, yeah, going. I was nervous. <laughs> we knew we were going to, to to uh, Europe, but right after we left Fort Lewis and went all the way across the Straits to States to Camp Miles Standish, which is just outside of Boston, and we knew we were going to Europe then. So, yeah, I was nervous. <laughs> and you were in England from February of '44 until February till, till uh, January or till July. Mm -hmm. We actually went in uh, uh, G July the 12th. We went into Normandy. And you're, once you got to Normandy and you saw the war zone, what were your thoughts? Well, I thought, well, I guess this is it. I'm going to have to learn to live with it, so do the best I can and keep my head ducked down. And uh, What was your introduction? What sort of initial experience did you get once you entered Normandy? Well, they put us with the, attached us to the 1st Infantry Division and uh, went, put us right up on the line so we get some firing experience. And, and then we also got some hedgerow experience, which was uh, uh, quite a deal because they, they, had to, they had to attack those hedgerows where there was one ever 50, 75 feet, there must have been a million of them. And when they, the infantry would go up, no, we would, we would fire and, and th then the infantry would go up and put a satchel charge on the, on the hedgerows because we couldn't go through them and then the one tank would go through and then after a whole platoon of tanks then the infantry would come through and then we had the whole same thing to do on the next one and uh, then this i don't could never remember uh, some major 
got the bright idea of taking all that angle iron off the beach and built teeth. They actually welded and fastened teeth on the front of our tanks and right through those babies in. So. so American ingenuity in that case kind of overcame the natural obstacles that the Germans oh, yeah. were using. Yeah. Uh -huh. What other instances did you see early in the, in the fighting in France where American initiative uh, was better or than you expected or better than the enemy expected? Uh, I don't know. That was, that was really the biggie in, in Normandy. Uh, actually, from then on, <laughs> when we got tangled up with those German tanks, uh, we didn't have it. They had it. We just had more of them than they did. That, uh, those, those 88s, and you look through the reticle on that 88, they, I don't know how they could even miss. Of course, they had bad gunners for a lot of, lot of reasons, but uh, they're, they're in, they're, uh, their engineering, as far as equipment was concerned, was far superior to ours. And you, your unit was the 735th Tank Battalion. Yeah. How would you describe your unit and the men of that unit? Well, like I say, we were well trained, and uh, by the time we got there, why well, <laughs> we knew what it was serious, and uh, I thought we did a good job overall and the guys were I know all, all the guys in my outfit were super you know so in July of 1944 you came across to France and the battle in northern France had gone on for a few months and you were there for the breakout in August early August of 1944 can you describe that push across France and some of the challenges you encountered well, actually, we went south and went. The, uh, the first town that we had, uh, that we took was Angers, and uh, it was easy. We went in one morning, and by the next afternoon, it was all over. So it wasn't there wasn't any serious. The only serious thing is we got seventy six bottles of wine there. But uh, then when we went, uh, we went right up the highway and nobody was in the tank but the driver all the rest of us sitting up on top just having a ball, you know. And we had a marvelous uh, reconnaissance. They, we never got attacked that we didn't know about. They were out ahead of us in Jeeps and with, and with uh, uh, Piper Cubs and they located them and then we would go up and make, make a battle fire and like it, like when we went for next town and went was the Chart, and we stopped out west of Chart about two miles, and it was evening. We waited till the next morning, and went around, came in from the back of it. By noon, it was all over there, and uh, so that was pretty much the run across France was run a run 25, 50 miles, and then do some fighting, and then another another run, and, and like I say, they they protected us all the way. We never were ambushed ambushed any place. Did you get a sense in that kind of headlong flight, that rush across France, did you think this is going to be over by Thanksgiving or Christmas? Should have been. Should have been. If it hadn't been that they give the gasoline to Monty when we ran out of gas, when we stopped, when we ran out of gas in, near Verdun, our cavalry reconnaissance was through Metz in the, through the magnet, through the uh, the uh, uh, Siegfried line, Siegfried line into Germany with no defense at all. If we'd have been in, we would have been in Berlin by Christmas, but but we sat there seven days, and then all the ones we'd bypassed in Normandy got back across us, got in the Maginot line, got in the Siegfried line, and then we had to dig them out, and uh, that. That took all winter, and then of course comes the bulge, and that screwed up the the other drive. And uh, you recoup recouped some of that energy and some of the strength in the late fall, and then Patton, who was commander of the Third Army, uh, made a mistake, maybe, uh, and attacked Metz. Can you describe your part in the attack on Metz and Fort? Well, the, the attacking Metz wasn't a mistake, but direct attack on Fort Riant was a mistake because. Well, see, he only did it to see if we could and found out we couldn't. But uh, the, they had to take Metz 
you know, that, that was that was not a mistake. It was just, and he had like four, five, four or five divisions in there to take me at. So we had a lot of, 5th Division had a lot of help there. I had an armored division and you see the 95th and uh, I forget how many, that there was four or five divisions involved in that. But that had to be done. They had to take Mets. Mets had never been taken by the frontal assault in, 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 in forever. So that was the first time. How did the, the lack of supply, you mentioned the gasoline, can you talk to us about how the lack of supply hindered your operations? Well, that was really the only time we had any problem was that, that, that one particular when we were out of gas for seven days. The, the uh, what they call those guys? Uh, Red Ball. Red Ball. They did a marvelous job of keeping up. And we were running maybe 50, 60 miles a day. They did a marvelous job of keeping us supplied, but they couldn't bring it if they didn't have it, so. Yeah. We had mentioned General George S. Patton as commander of the Third Army, somewhat larger than life. A movie was made about him. He was your Army's commanding officer. Yeah. Um, other veterans have had a negative opinion of General Patton, thought he was too bloody um, or wasted lives. What's your opinion? I don't think they fought with him. The thing about Patton was, of course, he was a, he was a, a, a what's the word I want here? Uh, he studied war from the back as far as you could go. He knew what it did. And he also learned early on that attacking was a lot less loss than sitting back and, and waiting. And that was one of the reasons they thought he was bloody because he attacked when they didn't think he should. But, but I, I, I thought Patton was the best general in the Army by far. He made a lot of mistakes, you know, when he wasn't fighting, but he didn't make very many mistakes fighting. In, you have mentioned the Battle of the Bulge. Um, his army, Third Army, was attacking into the Lorraine, which was a former French province. Mm -hmm. On December 16th, the Germans counterattacked north of the Third Army into the Bulge area in the Ardennes, yeah. and he was able to rotate his army 90 degrees, and you were part of that, yeah. and it counterattacked into the Bulge. Can you talk to us a little bit about the counterattack? Well, if, if, if you saw the movie, Patton, and he went to this meeting, and they said, George, you've got to get your people up there to the bulge to help out. And George says, I can be there in 48 hours. And they said, George, it's impossible. He says, I can be there in 48 hours. Well, he had pulled us out of the line and started us up there the day before. We were halfway up there when he was talking about it, you know. So he did a lot of things like that. And, and uh had had a jump on them, but that was uh, that was messy. That bulge was real messy, and uh, they had a, a big advantage in the fact that, of course, they had this vast amount of troops in one small area, and we didn't expect it, so we didn't have the until we could finally get some up there, and there was a mess uh, for at least well, December was a disaster, but uh, it was. Uh, after we finally got the people up there and so we could do the job while we did the job, but it was messy to start with. You were a tank commander, a staff sergeant, correct? Yes, yeah. What responsibilities did you have, and let's say maybe during the Battle of the Bulge? Well, we just, you know, we just got, uh, we were on radio all the time, and we just got, uh, we were attached to the 26th Infantry Division, and we got our instructions from them, you know, and they really didn't know that much about tanks, so, it was a little touch and go for a while, but uh, we finally got it worked out. But, uh, did you have the same tank throughout the war? Or did, did No, you I lost four tanks. And uh, then we got, we got, we, we went into Normandy with, uh, with the M4 with a 75 millimeter cannon. It was an old French 75 from World War I that just turned it on the side put a, a, on a, a semi-automatic breach in it. Uh, w wouldn't do much with tanks, wouldn't do anything with Tigers. And then they finally got us a 76 rifle, which was better, but still was no match for the, they didn't get anything until the end of the war when they got the uh, Pershing over there with a 90, but we never did get any of those. We did get what they called a jumbo, and they took an M regular M4 and put four inches of armor 
around the turret and on the sides, in addition to what was already there. The result of which is if you got hit in the turret with an 88 with a regular one, it went all the way through. If you got hit with a jumbo, it went through part of it and then rattled around in the turret a while. So it was, it was a good idea, but not too good. So. Yeah. When it came to some of the infantry support that you were called upon to do with the 26th Division and the 5th Division, what were some of the tasks that your tanks were given? Well, they, they, a lot of time they would want us to, to uh, go where we couldn't go uh, and without, a, without infantry help, you know, and they finally figured it out that, you know, we can do it, but we need some help. Like, we're helping you, you need to help us too. And once we got that figured out, we did pretty well. But Did you lose any tanks to Panzerfaust, the German shoulder-launched rockets? Well, I didn't, but our outfit did, lost a couple, wow, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's where the infantry support kind of came, came in key. Were they also, would they, infantry, right. how else would the infantry assist your tankers? Well, uh, they, they would protect our flank, you know, because, I mean, we could see ahead, not too much on the side. And, and from bazookas and, and uh, uh, they call them Panzerfaust, I guess, we call them bazookas. And, uh, but they, uh, they also w would uh, wear, uh, let us know, they, of course, they had, in, they had reconnaissance ahead. They let us know where the tanks were and what, how, how many and what kind and all that stuff, you know, make it a lot easier if you knew where you were going and what you were doing. But. With that kind of information, you had good reconnaissance. And if they said there are enemy ar there's enemy armor, had Mark IVs or, or Tiger tanks, would you change your approach? Well, you had to because you can't head on a, a Tiger tank. I don't care. In fact, I get in, in uh, Normandy, we were out, just our tank one day was just clearing out a field, making sure that it was, there was no Germans in there. And we looked down a, a hill and there was a town down there. I said, let's go down there and see if we can get some wine. Well, we pulled into the town and of course there's, right, there's always a circle in the town. We pulled up to it and stopped and sitting right here, 15 feet away, was a tiger. And his gun was pointed that way. Well, I says, go ahead, boot nose, knock him out. AP, and uh, so bounced off 15 feet. I says, damn it, I said AP. And, and the assistant gunner says, damn it, that was AP. <laughs> so tried it again, and I said, get out of here, Joe, because Fortunately, they did not have power travers. They had to crank it. And here come that gun around. <laughs> so we backed out, and by the time he got up to where, we were, where he could get a shot at us, we were gone. Yeah. But, it, it, you know, we found out right away that all that stuff they sh showed us in Africa, how, how tough the, the uh, M4s were, not, not true. You had to flank it or get behind it. Otherwise, you just didn't work with it at all. Yeah. You think, uh, what about the upgun when you got to 76? Would that have given Help, you? Helped a little bit. Helped a little bit. Like it went from, uh, let's see, I think the, the if I remember, the uh, muzzle velocity of a 75 was about 1,800 feet. And then and when we got the, uh, 76s, I think it went up to around 2,200. The 88 was 4,800. So the big difference, yeah. big difference. Yeah. But yeah, it helped a little bit, but not, not a bunch. You still had to flank them. <laughs> but there were more, as you said, we had numbers on our side. Yeah, and, and yeah. Could you yeah. also maybe attribute American success to teamwork? Oh yeah, no question about that. I mean, they're making tanks like crazy over here and and we're using them up like crazy over there. So, yeah, we never had any shortage of tanks. I mean, if you lose a tank today, they had you another one tomorrow. So, you know, keep going. Yeah. After the bulge and your unit was attached to the 26th, did you uh, stay and help reduce that or were you no, reassigned us, to the 5th? No, moved us over to the, actually, we had one platoon that was with the 76th for about two weeks, and then they attached us to the 87th. 
and we finished the war with 87. So we did uh, we did all the Rhine work and and uh, all the run across Germany, and of course we ended up in Czechoslovakia. So that's that was all with the 87th. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about the Rhine uh, crossing? The Rhine line? was uh, that's another one of those George Patton things. Here, George, do not cross the Rhine. George, do not cross the Rhine. Well, you know George, and I don't know where he got him, but he had uh, was it two or three, two. Uh, just flat out like fishing boats, you know. They had the U.S. Navy on the side of them. I don't know where he got them. Just a little re regular old outboard motors, and they took two steel treads and taped them to those two, and we ran out on there right across the Rhine, and and that's the way we cross it. Now they finally got a bridge across there, and a lot of them went across on a, on a pontoon bridge, but we crossed on two motorboats. <laughs> what kind of resistance? Did didn't have any at all when we first crossed over. We went up in, oh, maybe 10 miles before we run into a town and there was any resistance and there wasn't much there. In fact, the rest of the war was pretty much they were running away from us and we were running after them. So that part of the war was after we got across the Rhine was, was uh, a heck of a lot easier. As you got closer towards Czechoslovakia and into Czechoslovakia, and the war is winding down. You know that the Soviet army is coming mm -hmm. from the other direction. We, we were headed, we thought we were headed for uh, Berlin, but uh, of course they wouldn't let, wouldn't let George go to Berlin. He wanted to, bad, but. Uh, Did you find that the German troops stopped running away from you and were surrendering instead? Yeah, then they came running back and wanted us to capture them. They, wanted, they didn't want the Russians, they wanted us to capture them because they knew what would happen, they did, well, the same thing would happen as they did to the Russians when the Russians were over there, when they were in Russia. So they, they, really, they really wanted to give up to us for that reason. When you were in Germany and the war was winding down, uh, what were your thoughts as far as you're seeing the destruction and devastation from the bombing and from the ground combat, what were your thoughts? I don't know, it's kind of think this man is a sure a waste of, of a, a lot of things and for no, not really a good reason. We knew there was a good reason, but I mean, when you stop and think about the whole thing, well, for instance, Plowin, which is near Czechoslovakia, there was not one building whole in that whole, entire city. They, 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 uh, the, the British, did a pattern bombing on it in the daytime, and this, then the next night, the, the Americans did another pattern bombing at night, and they just simply wiped that town out. Nothing left. And that was seemed like such a waste. But, you know. Did you encounter any uh, prisoner of war camps or concentration camps? Uh, we did uh, go through, uh, we didn't go through it, we went by it, and uh, kind of, took a look in, now Max, Max was in it. And in fact, he's got an article, if you, if you go online and go to 735th Tank Battalion, uh, it, it'll come up with his article about how he was in this, uh, I don't forget whether it was Book and Vault or, I'm not sure which, but. Uh, As Max and other troops who were there talked to the other guys in your unit and you drove past and saw it, did your attitudes change towards the German people? Well, <laughs> we had a kind of nasty attitude anyway, so I guess it, yeah, it did change some, but you bet, because it was, uh, it was ugly, ugly. What, um, I've read various books by historians, and one of them breaks down motivation, as far as uh, initial motivation to join, and he, he examined the Civil War, um, and he talks about sustaining motivation, what kept soldiers uh, in the line or in camps uh, as opposed to deserting, which wasn't as much of a problem in World War II, but what kept them fighting? And so I guess my question is, did you have any sustaining motivation, something that kept you going? Well, 
we knew that the, we, we knew we were never going to go home until the war was over. So the sooner you get the war is over, you, the sooner you're going to get to go home. I, you know, it was, it, that was a motivation for me anyways. Uh, I, I, there wasn't any question that I was going to get the job done. It was a question of how long it was going to take. And so I, I, motivation, that was mine. His book is called For Cause or For Comrades, and I guess the cause was to destroy fascism, to destroy Nazism. Um, and then the comrades were the guys in the tank with you. Which stood out more in your mind? I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Which was more important, I guess, in your mind? Was it the cause as far as defeating tyranny and fascism, or was it the comrades, the people you fought with that kept you going? I was... I would imagine you, that it was the people because after all, you're part of it and if you don't do your part, then you're not helping that their part and it was pretty much that way all around, you know. We wanted to help each other and, and you surely didn't want to be a coward, you know. So it, it was just, there was only really one way to go and that was forward. Did you... When you went into Czechoslovakia at the end of the war, did you meet any of the elements of the Soviet army? No, no. We didn't get to the Soviet army until uh, they pulled us back. They made a line, and the Russians were there, and we were here. And we didn't really get into any Russians until that, and that was, I'm guessing, maybe two weeks, maybe a month after the war was over. And... Uh, then we sold them everything we had. I mean, <laughs> they'd buy anything. Cigarettes, you'd get 50 bucks a carton. And uh, <laughs> But what was sad about that, and, and I've never seen this published, the, the Russian army borrowed our plates for, for uh, invasion currency. They used our plates. The only difference was there was a zero on the end of the numbers. And they paid. In fact, I walked into a warehouse one day. They were paying all these soldiers. Some of them hadn't been paid for three or four years. And they were just laying out big stuff, you know. And it was all invasion currency. Well, we weren't allowed to send that home to start with. They finally did. We sent millions of it home, you know. So what we did is we paid their, their back all their back uh, army pay with, with that invasion currency. I've never seen that published any place, but I saw it happen, so I know it happened. So Soviet counterfeited, Soviets counterfeited your invasion currency. Well, no, they had the permission to use it. Oh, okay. They had permission to use it, but they told us originally, you can't, you can't send that home, you know. You can send ours home, but you can't send that home. And, uh, but they finally did, and so... You know, well, yeah, that's 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 politics. One I of guess. the mysteries. Yeah. yeah. Um, what lasting impression um, did your service make on the rest of your life? Well, I don't. I I can't. I don't know. It it helped. Uh, I grew up, I'll tell you, in a, I was a, just a brat when I went in, and I grew up fast, and uh, I think it taught me responsibility a lot, lot, lot sooner, a lot better. Uh, uh, and, uh, and the fact that if you, if you stay after something long enough, you can finally get it done. So, so that kind of endurance... Yeah, De yeah. Determination. To uh -huh, uh -huh. Was there any any discussion as far as your unit maybe being transferred to the Pacific? Oh, we were headed for the Pacific. We were getting ready to go when they dropped the bomb. We would have been in we would have been in Japan eventually if we had made it that far. You know, they would have lost. If they had to drop that bomb, they they would have lost hundreds of thousands of troops taking Japan. Hundreds of thousands. What was your feeling at the time when you found out that the Japanese had surrendered? Oh, I was tickled to death because <laughs> we really didn't want to go over there. You know, that's, 
That's not a place for tanks at all. That kind of Ivan fighting is no place for tanks. Now they used them over there. They didn't. I don't know how much good they did, but uh, uh, we weren't weren't looking forward to that at all. Let me hit the next page. I guess a, a follow up. Did you have any personal feelings when you heard about the atomic weapons being used? Well, I, was, I was tickled to death, honestly. I wasn't. I was more at that point in time. I was more considering my own, and 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 that was probably selfish. I'm sure it was, but in the long run, it saved a lot of a lot of lives. And it's hard for people to believe that, but they. The, besides the hundreds of thousands that we would have lost, the Japanese would have lost hundreds of thousands trying to keep us from going there. So. Actually, in the, in the end run, there's, uh, there was a lot less lives lost than if they hadn't used it. Mm -hmm. I, uh, one of my final papers was regarding that topic, mm -hmm. the decision, Truman's decision to use the, the atomic weapons. And the previous president, Herbert Hoover, was very good at bean counting, very good at numbers, and he was asked in the summer of 45 by President Truman to evaluate what he thought it would cost in lives, both American and Japanese. Uh, and he said, probably close to a million American lives if we invade both islands. There were two invasions. Yes. Uh -huh. And upwards of 20 million Japanese. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I, I, I think history would probably definitely agree with you, or, or at least uh, the theoretical historians looking at the situation would say, yeah, it probably would have been much more costly had yeah. we invaded yeah. conventionally. So, uh, you wrote a book recently about your time in the service and in the course of writing that book and in, in researching did you discover anything about your unit and the men you served with or about the war? I didn't really research that book. I just sat down and wrote what I remembered happened as it happened and tried to eliminate the blood and a lot of the unhappy parts of it and a lot of the happy parts of it I could put in there. And, uh, but I didn't do any research at all. I, the only thing I did is I, uh, I took a, a, net, a course on the net on uh, sentence structure, and that helped me. And then, of course, uh, Jane McBigger, uh really helped me because she's a, she's a book writer, and, and she knew all the ins and outs, and she did help me a lot. So have you go back and talk about what it would have meant for you and the men of the 735th if they hadn't dropped the atomic bombs and how the war would have ended. So just maybe pause a second, and then if you want to just tell us what you think might have happened or how it would have affected Well, like I say, we were, we were uh, getting equipped and ready to go to the Far East. And we didn't know where we'd go or what part we would do, but we knew it wasn't going to be any fun. So... Uh, as far as the semantics, I had no idea how they were going to do that, what kind of a ship they would put it on, put us on, or anything. But we were on all kinds of ships. But uh, that's uh, I, I don't know. I can't I can't say what they would have done with us. But I'm sure they'd have found a place. Did you after the war? Did you speak with any veterans of the Pacific Theater? Do what? Did you speak with any veterans of the Pacific? Oh war? yeah, oh yeah. I've talked to a lot of guys that were over there, and they. They had it, we had it bad. They had it nasty over there. So it was just a, the thing about it, we were fighting the Germans and, and they had the same kind of a deal. We, if we don't kill you, you're going to kill us. And there wasn't really any, per, any personal with it, see. It wasn't that way over there. Those Japanese were, they were, uh, I don't know how would you say they were nasty. They were uh, fanatical. Perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a lot of cases, they were, and, and you, did, you, you, if you, in the Germans, especially if you didn't get the Wehrmacht. I mean, if you didn't get the, uh, uh, what was their SS? Huh? The SS. Yeah, yeah. If you didn't get the SS, uh, and incidentally, that was one of Hitler's big mistakes. That taking all the the pride of the army and putting in the SS and leaving nothing in the regular army. But anyways, uh, that's, uh, that's, I don't know where it's going now. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
shoot, I had a thought there. You know that gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me that. Right. <laughs> so um, I'll recap the question and then I'll let you answer and then we'll move on here. Um, so in your, in your opinion, Truman's decision to use the atomic weapons to quickly end the war saved lives. Absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of lives. A lot more than it killed. Okay. They, because they don't want to use my voice. They want to hear you say, uh, dropping the bombs saved American in general. Yeah, yeah. Dropping the bombs saved up. Well, I, we, the figures we got was hundreds of thousands of, uh, of Americans and, and, and in excess of a million Japanese. Defending would they, they would if they hadn't dropped that bomb, that's what would have happened. And uh, so I, you know, I, like I said, I was a little bit selfish. I I was tickled death because I didn't have to go to South Pacific. And uh, but that's that. There ain't any question in my mind that that was the thing to do. Your tank battalion still holds reunions. Yes. And at the last reunion, you told me you met with your tank gunner? Yes, yes. I've got to call that dude, too. Uh, <laughs> can, you, can you talk to me about meeting with him and, and what you had to talk about? Well, we got, of course, we had a lot to talk about, you know. And, I, and I'm thinking, on this book that I wrote, did, did I dream some of that or what, did that really happen? Well, I went through everything when he was uh, my gunner. And he... he uh, agreed on everything that I've written, written in there, so I didn't dream it. It that actually happened. But yeah, he he's uh, best, one of the best gunners in in the battalion. He was saved your life. Oh, well, lots of times, lots of times. And that's something that it's been sixty-seven years probably since you saw him. And yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Did. You pick up what kind of bond do you just share? Like we'd never been, not never been apart, really. And uh, is that something that combat soldiers, men who've seen combat together, they have? Well, especially in a tank. I mean, I'm I'm standing behind him, uh, less than a foot away, for ten months. You know, you get to know a guy if you didn't know him before. So, yeah, it's. It's, 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 tanks are, I think, a little bit different than the infantry. Infantry are close, but I think the tankers are closer because of the, the closeness that they were all the, all the time in the, in the tanks. I went back through our previous interview, our transcript from 2007, and you talked about a Captain Miller who was in his Jeep and leading an attack up a hill and how you had armor around you and you felt secure and there were these soldiers, your, your uh, armored infantry, your infantry around you, and they showed incredible courage to continue the attack. Can you talk to us about that a little bit? I'm not sure. The, the talk to us about um, the courage of the infantry that supported your tank. They weren't inside an armored vehicle. Right, right. And they had to dig their own holes, and, and they had no tops on them, so, you know, that's... that's not always the best way to go, but yeah, they had uh, the infantry was a lot tougher than, than armor. Uh, we had, yeah, we had, we were in a firebox. They could blow us out of there any time, but still, on the long run, it was a heck of a lot easier than those doughboys had it. They had it tough. At what point, <clears throat> at what point, either before you entered the service or after, did you feel that the Allies, the Americans, we were going to win the war. Well, I thought we were going to win it all the time. I mean, you know, just a question of how long it was going to take. But uh, yeah, we we uh, we get, got all trained up there in England and got our tanks all fixed up, and and we knew we'd get it done. Just a question of how long. So. Um, and I may go back on some other points, but uh, is is there anything? that you would like future generations, either students or historians or just anyone, that you would like them to know about your service in World War II? 
Yeah, no, not except the fact that it's something that had to be done and and uh, the th I was drafted. I was I did not enlist, but uh, it's still something that had to be done and there's still something that has to be done. In fact, I'm really proud of our troops that we have over there now because they all enlisted. They asked for it. They're getting a getting the shaft when they get back, but then that's another story. Let me see if there's any notes, anything I missed. Or, or Frank, tell me if I've missed something. Um, this may be something, and something I'm not very clear on, but when you went into a battle, and you said you had good reconnaissance out front, and then once you knew, okay, there's the enemy. Can you kind of walk me through an engagement? How you would deploy your tanks and, and what the fighting would be like. You mean if, if, if we're fighting tanks? Or a defensive position. If, 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 if they don't have tanks, we take them head on. Because, see, they can't really hurt us except with bazookas. And they got to get close to do that. But if they had tanks, we had to do some finagling and figure around how to get on the side or the back. That's the only way you could, could kill a tiger was either from the back or the or in, in between the, the uh, turret and the hull or in the bogies. That's the only chance you had. You couldn't get them front head on at all. Back, they had six inches armor on, or I mean, oh, about three inches armor on the back. It, they were easy to get on the back, but you had to get behind them to do it. So. Would it artillery? What what kind of coordination did you have with your artillery? Had good, good artillery. In fact, we fired artillery sometimes. They uh, that's, they sent me to a school in in uh, Fort Lewis to learn how to lay with a naming circle and lay a, a battalion. I mean, a, 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 a artillery. And when they used our tanks as artillery, and, they, and we just tied into their forward observers, and they directed our fire. We did that three or four times. And when, how often would you say your unit was up in the line? close enough to firing range where they're all the time all the all time. time yeah mm -hmm. what would a typical day be well depend on where you were and on in in France we might run 50 or 60 miles sitting out on top of the the tank and drinking wine and, and nobody's in the tank but the driver and he's halfway out and uh, uh, and that and then comes to the serious part of it that was different but uh, we had a lot of those days, really. So, like I'm saying, it was, it was there's, it was bad, but there were good parts too. So. After you crossed the Rhine, you said resistance was somewhat low. Did it feel like that run across France again? No, it was easier than that because we knew that there were some points of resistance where we were really going to have a battle. And with Germany, they just were running, and we were chasing them. And uh, so that there, there never really was much, much battling in that. It was they maybe we'd saw down a lot of trees and we'd have to move the trees so we could get through or maybe something like that. But not not real much battle. What sort of troops? I I think the common conception is that the Germans were reduced to children and and old men. Oh yeah, they had a lot of that. It's like I said that. That one, one of Hitler's biggest mistakes was when he created the, the SS. And he took the cream of the crop out of the Wehrmacht and put them all in the SS. Now, you hit an SS outfit, you kill them all. There was nobody giving up. You hit a Wehrmacht, if you get the officers, there's nobody to take over. Nobody knows what to do, and they just fall apart. And that happened a lot. So you just, you just hope you wouldn't get the SS. How often did you run into them? Ma'am? How often did you run into the SS? Oh, about three or four times, I think, is all we did. But Do uh, you recall any, any particular battle or engagement? No, no. I think that part of the people in Fort Driant were SS. I don't know how many. Also, a lot of the people in Fort Driant were from... Um, a military school that hadn't been in combat yet, but uh, didn't make any difference. 
in the air power. No air power. No air power. Didn't make it. <laughs> I guess I, I, you've expand, exhausted my questions, Frank. Well, that's good. <laughs> um, I'll just finish. I, I guess my last question would be, you know, do you ref when you think about your service during the war, what do the words service or duty mean to you? Well, it was duty. You know, it was it was had to be done. I mean, the service was yeah, that was it was, but duty was the, was a thing. You, you went out every day. That was your duty. That was your part of the war. And if you didn't do your part, you're letting somebody else down. So it was it was more duty, I think, than service. You look back with great pride at your time in the service. Yes, I do. I do. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of what we did. I think we did a good job. Well, on behalf of Ball State University and WIPB, I thank you for your service. Well, you're Thank welcome. you for coming here today. It was my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Frank. Thank you.